All right, welcome back everyone. So some big news to go into <laughs> seems to be the case lately. Uh, folks, Xi Jinping, the head of the Chinese Communist Party, just gave orders to the military in China to prepare for war. Now, the full context of this is not yet clear. I'll be explaining it. But right now, you basically have a perfect storm of crisis. You have the Chinese Communist Party dealing with, the, with their uh, real estate potential collapse. You have infighting within the party itself. You have the CCP facing all the internal turmoil, uh, basically facing possible economic collapse uh, tied to, of course, the real estate collapse and also to other things, which I'll go into. At the same time, U.S. is hitting the hitting its debt ceiling, meaning the government could shut, shut down. And also, as this happens, uh, they seem to be so set on mandating the vaccine that even right now the Navy SEALs can't deploy, for example, unless they get the vaccine. So you really have uh, globally the perfect storm a perfect storm of crisis really just on the brink of happening, essentially. Um, I'll explain what's going on with this, a few other issues to go into as well with that. Also, folks, in New York City, well, New York overall, they've issued now a state of emergency over healthcare workers because, of course, they're mandating the healthcare, they're mandating the vaccines for healthcare workers. Thousands of them are not getting the vaccines, meaning that they're having understaffing in the hospitals like we've been talking about what's going to happen. Those of you who watch us for a while. And basically the situation is serious enough that the New York, um, the New York state governor, again, the new one, is talking about bringing, bringing in the National Guard and using them to fill the hospitals. Um, kind of a very strange militarization of the hospital system. We'll see how that plays out as well, especially because they also need to be, well, vaccinated. And of course, medical workers within the military, not all of them are trained doctors as you would need for most things other than maybe giving someone an injection. So um, another issue too, folks, Biden is now saying that we can go back to normal. Uh, that is once we receive, uh, once we achieve up to 98% vaccination. So in other words, probably never, um, unless they force it on people, because right now the people who aren't getting the vaccine, I doubt they're going to change their minds. We've already reached the stage where the chance of people changing their minds in the vaccine is very slim. And the more government tries to mandate it, very likely the less people are going to want it. So uh, it seems we're in this for the long haul. Justin Trudeau in Canada is also making deals with Pfizer to get the booster shots and vaccines going into 2024. So... No end to this in sight so far. A lot brewing. Um, I'm going to be going over all these things. It's interesting, folks. When, when you take the broad perspective of everything happening right now, it's very interesting. And what is the ancient Chinese curse is, may you live in interesting times, right? That said, folks, good seeing you all here, as always. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Miss Jamie said, hello, Josh. Thank you. Florida girl, good to see you as always. You said, amen, Josh. Um, yeah, here we are, right? <laughs> Sophia, you said, China prepared for to fix J20, <laughs> probably. Um, and actually, Natalie Winters had an interesting story, too, that um, guess where Dr. Fauci has been? He's been speaking to some Wuhan, um, some Wuhan conference, uh, along with the head of this company that was kind of the middle ground between him, his organization, and financing virus research in China. Uh, very strange stuff going on, folks. Of course, we're going to go into all this. Let's start with the first story, then we'll go into some other things. I want to start by talking about Xi Jinping calling on the military in China to prepare for war. It says here, this is Epic Times, China's Xi, that's Xi Jinping, expects un inspects undisclosed space base asks military to make preparations for war. It says Chinese leader Xi Jinping recently inspected an undisclosed space base in northwestern China and instructed the military officers and soldiers to, quote, make preparations for war. Now, Chinese state media reported this. This isn't some random you know, report somewhere. This is Chinese state media reporting it. And this happened during an inspection of the space base in Shanxi province on September 15th. So a couple weeks ago, right? 
She stated that space assets are strategic assets of the CCP that must be managed and utilized well. He praised the base for having made a significant contribution to the CCP's aerospace development and told the military personnel to improve combat readiness and aim at becoming a world-class army, as well as a space superpower. Notably, this is as the Democrats are trying to get rid of Space Force, uh, which was Trump's organization that could really challenge this. Beijing-based DW News said that this was Xi Jinping's first public inspection of the CCP's strategic support forces. I'll be explaining what that means. And the site also was very likely the Xi'an Satellite Measurement and Control Center, codenamed the 26th Experimental Training Base, or Unit 63750 in the military. Um, briefly on this, folks, just a bit of details on how the Chinese military function or is structured. The strategic support force is kind of the new war fighting element of the Chinese military. Basically, you might remember when Barack Obama was still president and he indicted these five Chinese hackers. That was under uh, Unit 61398, I believe, of General Staff Department, 3rd Department, which was the signals intelligence branch of the Chinese military. The 3rd Department was the essentially war fighting branch of the Chinese military. 4th uh, Department would have been the uh, signal, sorry, the electronics intelligence branch. Second department would be the human intelligence branch. They, after Xi Jinping came in, uh, well, started restructuring things. He basically purged a lot of the military, restructured it, and established deeper personal control over the Chinese military. Part of that process was is he got rid of the old structures. Uh, General Staff Department, for example, is no longer around. They took that and they put it into the strategic support force. So this strategic support force, the one we're discussing here, is really the backbone of the Chinese Communist Party's real systems for fighting wars. Unconventional war, space warfare, as we were discussing. Um, I see PM Ilsen, LIG, asking about space war. All right, so this sounds sci-fi, but let me explain it briefly. Basically, folks, space is regarded as the ultimate high ground. If China, for example, were to put nuclear weapons in space, that's game over. Uh, the, if, you know, if everyone talks about the Chinese military and military readiness and hypersonic missiles and the J-20 jet, basically the way that in the United States we would normally think of military power. For the CCP, though, a lot of that's smoke and mirrors. The real war fighting element of the CCP, if China were to attack the United States, uh, would be the program they call the Assassin's Mace program, also called the, it uh, translates either way, either Assassin's Mace or Trump card. Essentially, this involves surprise attack, uh, which would involve um, what they call hemp attacks, high Earth orbit nuclear detonation to wipe out um, electronic infrastructure using the EMP blast, electromagnetic pulse blast. And then they would launch rapid attacks, uh, Mumbai-style scoot-and-shoot things, terror attacks on U.S. soil using controlled assets already here on the ground through things like the United Front Work Department and basically try to bring the United States or other countries to, the, to their knees within the first week. Um, that is the uh, Assassin's Mace program. They call it the Little White Rabbit of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, essentially, this would be what real war with China would look like. A uh, great book on this, uh, geez, it was Michael Pillsbury's Crouching Tiger, something, I can't remember named it, Crouching Tiger, I think was the name of it. Uh, Michael Pillsbury's book goes into the Assassin's Mace program. He said that when he applied Assassin's Mace during war gaming programs with the US military, uh, it was the only time the US military actually lost a simulated battle. So, Assassin's Mace. So what she is meeting with here, the strategic support force would be the military branch that would do this. The military branch that would run those kinds of operations would be the one that Xi Jinping is meeting with right now. So not to be alarming, <laughs> um, but yeah, he's telling them to prepare for war. This would be the real, the real face of Chinese warfare, uh, CCP warfare. And he's meeting with the branch that would be essentially leading this. Now, I'll continue on this a bit. And there's a lot I want to go into with this as well. Um, real brief, though, folks, I have mentioned we're still demonetized by YouTube. Luckily, though, we do have sponsors. 
Tonight's episode is brought to you by Secure, something becoming increasingly increasingly relevant, uh, which is, of course, well, your privacy when sending emails, when chatting with friends, having discussions online. There have been over 155 million Americans affected by data leaks back in 2020 alone, and the average American, you and I, or those of you outside the country as well, probably had similar numbers, experienced personal data being stolen about four times over the past year. People get anxious because they can't protect their online data and uh, their online activity. But now there's a new email and messenger app called Secure. That's S-E-K-U-R. They can give privacy and security for sending emails and messages. Secure's server and server and data center are hosted in Switzerland. And Switzerland has the strictest data privacy laws in the world. Even if the U.S. were to request their data, there's a long process for it. And they would have to alert you. Secure is also the only private and secure messaging and email app that does not rely on big tech companies like Amazon, Google, or Microsoft because a lot of times they, they supply some of the underlying technologies. That means it's also not subject to the intrusive cloud act, which would mean that, again, your information would still be viewable to some extent by government forces. Secure does not ask for your phone number, does not mine your data, does not upload your contacts, typically like all other applications of this type do. And its messenger functions by adding people you know and then adding the secure number. If you want to invite someone who's not a secure member, you just send them an invite. In this way, you're protected from hackers getting into your phone, and you also have full privacy when you're on the app. Now, it costs only $5 for the messenger and $10 for the email and messenger package. You can visit secure.com today for a a free free seven-day trial, or you can use the promo code JOSHUA to get 25% off and big thanks out to secure and all folks privacy is becoming increasingly relevant. Now I want to continue on what's happening with Xi Jinping telling part of the strategic support force to prepare for war. Now on this, I'll continue the story then I'll go into some other details on this. It says for Xi Jinping preparing for war can not only divert attention from internal crisis, but at the same time help to shape himself into the image of a national hero who defeats both foreign forces and political enemies. Now, you might ask why Xi Jinping would want to do that. It's because right now the Chinese Communist Party is basically risking collapse. They're, they have a few different crises at hand right now. Now, on one side, um, the Chinese economy is basically about to collapse. This is going to have global a global ripple effect. I mentioned you really have the perfect storm of economic crisis globally right now. Let me explain how big this is. Folks, this is probably the well one of it's hard to say what's the biggest story these days. In any normal circumstance, this would be like the biggest story in the world if we didn't have the virus and we didn't have all this other craziness happening right now. This would be like the biggest story in the world. Let's look at the full picture. In the United States, right now, as we speak, the federal government has hit its debt ceiling. This means it can't borrow any more money unless they raise the debt ceiling, which means for the first time in U.S. history, the federal government is about to default, which means basically the federal government is going to become non-functional very, very soon. Unless they raise the debt ceiling, the bill to pass that was blocked in the Senate on a 48 to 50 vote. It's not happening. Uh, The Democrats right now are trying to push it through and make it so Biden can push it through without going through the Senate. Probably not going to happen either. Uh, Basically, folks, it means U.S. government is about to default. It's going to have a ripple effect across the government workers in some regards, maybe. Who knows if this is a good thing or bad thing at this point? Frankly, I th- I'd say the stuff they're spending money on doesn't seem to be benefiting the American people a whole lot these days. You can talk about, you know, we need roads and we need uh, uh, schools. Frankly, the schools are pushing forward critical race theory and common core. The roads are falling apart anyways. And a lot of the money is being sent to things that have no value to the American people in many regards, like bailing out cities that, that have unresponsible spending anyways. But this is also happening during during a very critical time internationally, which has me actually looking at this from a few different angles. At the same time this is happening, the Chinese economy is also about to collapse. Now, a few things with this. Global, let me, before I go into China, let me talk about the other parts of this. You also have a global shipping crisis right now. The story on, the full story in this is also not being told. 
basically, if you look at maps of ships all around the world and, of course, bringing goods into ports, it's backed up. You can look at the United States. There's a line of ships going like way, way deep into the uh, you know, Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. It's hugely backed up. We have a major, major shipping crisis in the U.S. right now. Um, the way the Biden administration is trying to deal with this right now is in a way that a lot of people in the industry say is probably not going to work, which is basically forcing the ports to accept the cargo from the ships rather than waiting in line to drop it off. The problem you have then is it doesn't resolve the issue of just shipping and the entire logistical process. Uh, because again, the problem is not just the ports. The problem is the entire shipping system. Uh, you have, of course, truck drivers and all these other things. If they if the ships drop the goods off at the ports, this is one of the reasons why goods are so costly right now. Prices are going up. One of the reasons they can't just drop them off at the ports also is because uh, a lot of these are perishable goods. Some, the ports have limited capacity to support that, meaning if they drop it off, you're going to have a lot of perished goods, even though it might unclog the shipping process of the ships themselves. The way the Biden administration is trying to get around this, rather than increasing capacity at the ports or opening up new ports, or you know, even that would be a bit of a process, is basically by talking about imposing fines on truck drivers if they don't basically do things fast enough, which is probably going to cause some of them to either hold a strike, as Rich and Adonis is noting they're already planning, <laughs> or they're going to quit. Um, and it's not going to resolve the crisis regardless. The deeper reason for this international shipping crisis though is not really being spoken about properly anyways though. This started, well, there's a few different causes for it, but one of the main ones is that the Chinese Communist Party had a virus case at one of their shipping ports. They shut it down. It's caused this backup within the international shipping system collapse. You're, you're having a collapse in the international shipping system. A lot of these companies work on very small margins as well, meaning that if they lose, start losing profit over a long period of time. And remember, we had a few other incidents like, I believe, the Suez Canal getting blocked and other things. If they start losing time, eventually the overhead goes away and that tiny bit of money they make on each shipment, it adds up a lot, of course, and it's a huge industry eventually. But if they lose those small margins bit by bit across every ship, it's gone. And the shipping system right now is about to collapse. You have that happening. So debt crisis, shipping crisis, you also have the Chinese economy about to collapse. And let me explain this. Yeah, food, Florida girl you mentioned, that's right. You also, folks, have the Chinese economy about to collapse. Now, what are the two forces of the Chinese economy? Export economy and real estate. Both of these are collapsing. Let me explain it. And this is going to have a huge ripple effect, an interesting one. Now, on the economic side. Basically, the CCP was for a long time the manufacturing base of the world. How many company, companies already were starting to pull out of China even pre-COVID because of the regulatory overreach? Now, when the virus hit, China launched this aggressive form of diplomacy, wolf warrior diplomacy. Countries like India and Japan began even paying companies to leave China and build their factories in other countries. That happened, right? A lot of countries pulling manufacturing out of China. At the same time, China got hit by all these sanctions and tariffs. And those Trump-era tariffs are still in place. The Chinese high-tech economy, just from the chips alone, just from the chips alone would wipe out their high-tech economy. You're already seeing this. Now, because the CCP's export economy, not only because of that, but because of COVID and lockdowns in addition to it, is collapsing, what did they do? The other way they've been building their economy is through mega projects, things like building these ghost cities. You might have seen these ghost cities in China. Check out videos if you haven't seen it. It's very interesting. Huge cities nobody lives in. Those are not financed just magically. Now, part of the CCP's reasoning behind this is you finance these huge projects, you get people employed, and you get money circulating within the economy. People take that money, it goes into jobs, it circulates within the local economy. The problem is because they're a totalitarian communist system, a lot of that money doesn't go to the people on the ground. It goes to the wealthy communist party members who hold it up and stick it in warehouses or get it out of the country, buying up U.S. real estate, buying up stuff in other countries, putting it in hard assets, things like that. 
Um, in other words, it's not, it hasn't really been circulating as they planned. At the same time, the local, local um, provinces of China, the, little, the district heads that have to take care of this, they do it by taking out loans. All those loans are defaulting now. And what happens as well, when you have prices going up, you have building going up, but frankly, you don't have enough people to even fill in the homes, let alone people who can afford it because you still have massive poverty in China. Well, folks, you have a real estate bubble. Every single day over the past good while now, you've had, you've had at least one Chinese real estate company going out of business. Over 200 something have gone into business recently. And now you have one of the largest uh, real estate companies in China about to go basically up and under. They're about, to, they're about to go bankrupt. Now, because of some complex banking issues we won't get into, basically even the Chinese banks can't bail it out. The CCP could technically intervene, but even that wouldn't do a whole lot. The only, and so the, what the CCP under Xi Jinping is doing right now is they're trying to make it, the Xi, Xi Jinping, they're trying to make Biden basically remove the tariffs on China. It doesn't seem they're doing that either. What's going to happen then? Basically, the Chinese real estate industry is going to go under. That's over 30%, I believe, of the Chinese economy, in addition to 20-something percent of the export economy, meaning the CCP is about to economically collapse. And so, folks, take the full picture of this. The U.S. might default. They might not. We'll have to see. At this point, frankly, I would, given the global picture, I would rather not see the U.S. default, but who knows if it'll happen or not. Um, but the CCP is about to basically go up and under, economically at least. Now, understand this full picture. Shipping crisis, U.S. government financing crisis, China's uh, you know, real estate bubble bursting. A lot of the money is going to go elsewhere anyways. Global economic troubles on the horizon, not to mention the Federal Reserve already saying that inflation is pretty much unavoidable at this point. This is all happening right now, folks. Now, think about that. And then think about Xi Jinping, the head of the Chinese Communist Party. The CCP, in addition to facing economic crisis, and keep in mind, one of the main ways they subdue people is through financial interests. A lot of people who support the CCP do it because they don't want to lose their pensions. They do it because they think, oh, China makes me wealthy. That's going to go away right quick. It's already on the verge of it. Now, if that happens, and the CCP is fighting internally, Xi Jinping is launching new purges within the Communist Party itself. How do you save the country? How do you, well, not the country. How do you save the party? You get them focused on an external enemy. You get people, you ramp up patriotism. You focus them on something else, right? If you want to, you know, put out a fire, you do a controlled burn. You burn, you, you set another fire. That's how they put out forest fires and uh, brush fires, right? That's what they're doing, folks. That's what they're talking about doing. Xi Jinping is talking about doing this right now. This is where things are at. Now, one more note on this, another individual, Guai Yuan, a Chinese current affairs commentator living in Japan, told the Epic Times that the CCP is now in the middle of both internal and external crises. The external conflicts are very tense, but in reality, the regime's internal crisis is more acute, he said. Behind Xi, Xi Jinping's emphasis on war preparations is the urge to resolve internal crisis, as I just explained a bit. And Xi Jinping's real goal is to uh, strengthen his power. Yay. <laughs> Anyways, folks, that's where things are at. But there's some other big parts with all this, um, namely the CCP, as we mentioned previously, in its war fighting doctrines and plans have stated previously they need to get the U.S. involved in basically four separate wars to ensure that if a war did take place, it's not just the U.S. against China, and frankly, the whole world against China, that it's the U.S. against North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan, uh, Russia, maybe, and who knows who else. What's happening, folks? North Korea has fired unidentified projectiles into the ocean. Japan is now, Japan's defense ministry issued a statement saying it appears to have been a ballistic missile, meaning uh, North Korea is getting back on board with these kinds of nuclear threats, very likely. Now, as this happens, as foreign adversaries are threatening war against the United States, um, Erica Woods, you're asking Josh, what about Russia? 
Russia has been holding large scale military exercises in the borders of Ukraine, uh, looking like they're going to reinst reinstitute their war for you know Crimea and control of Ukraine and so on, which they started a while back. You have you have Iran um, ramping up again. You have Pakistan working with the CCP, uh, typically used for proxy wars against things like India. And now the Taliban in Afghanistan looking like they're part of that whole triad of terrorist nations, which would be Iran, Pakistan, and of course, Afghanistan now under the Taliban, although we'll see how they work with the CCP. A lot going on, folks. Um, now, given the situation, you would wonder, of course, well, is the U.S. preparing for war? Are we, are we preparing for the CCP threat? If the Chinese Communist Party under Xi Jinping is giving orders to the military to prepare for war, they're discussing publicly even. They're not even hiding it. You actually have actual public documents talking about this. Um, you know, preparing for war, state media is talking about it. Uh, there's been other reports saying that they regard uh, they regard the virus situation as a World War III scenario. Uh, public officials in China have been stating this. This is not conspiracy by any means. They're saying this. They're not hiding it whatsoever. The way they're saying it basically is that World War I and World War II both basically remade the global the global political systems. And they view COVID-19 or the CCP virus as being a tool through which they can also remake the global political systems. There's a Chinese saying, within crisis is opportunity. They regard this as such. Now, given this situation where the CCP is not hiding its intentions whatsoever and is talking about all these things, you would wonder, well, is the U.S. preparing? This brings us to our next story. Navy SEALs in the United States are being told they're not able to deploy. They're undeployable if they don't get the COVID-19 vaccine, according to lawyers. It says here, Navy SEALs have been informed by the superiors that they won't be deployed if they refuse to get a COVID-19 vaccine, even if they're granted a religious or medical exemption, according to lawyers representing the elite special operations troops in a document seen by the Epic Times. This is according to one of the individuals who's representing the seven seals who filed this lawsuit. He said, what we've been told is if they, is if they apply for religious accommodation, they will no longer be deployable. So they can apply for religious exemption, which you're entitled to in the United States, but they won't be able to deploy to fight wars if they do that. Now, they're in talks with about 20 others. This may be an expanding case. There's seven SEALs part of it, 20 others possibly joining. Timothy uh, Parle Ator, whose firm represents a number of SEALs and other service, service members concerned about the vaccine, said his clients, in addition to this, have also been given a similar ultimatum. There's a couple cases. Some Navy SEALs have been sent home mid-deployment. They they're on deployment fighting our wars. They're sent home mid-deployment for refusing to take a vaccine. One of his clients at least told him. A document presented to the SEALs says that any special operations personnel, including special warfare combatant craft crewmen who refuse to receive the COVID-19 vaccine based solely on personal or religious beliefs, will be disqualified from special operations duty. So folks, they can't deploy. Um, I've spoken to other service members as well. They've been told as well that they're no longer able to interpret the Constitution, uh, that it's not their right to interpret the Constitution, that this needs to be done by who knows who else. And so other forces are interpreting the Constitution for them, which does, of course, have protections on free speech, religious liberty, freedom of belief, and your ability to vote for you, who you choose to vote for. They're now regarding even Trump supporters as being a type of possible extremism. Again, the former president of the United States, the commander in chief, which if you're under the military, you're not even legally allowed to oppose. So that's part of it. Also, folks, do you remember, maybe you saw the video, there was a viral video of a US Marine officer who uh, made this video criticizing the higher ups in the decision to pull out of Afghanistan. Basically, if you were to leave a country normally like this, the last thing you would abandon would, of course, be the airport if you abandon it at all. 
And the last thing you would pull out of the country would be your military forces. You get the civilians out, you get the people who supported you out, you get all of them out, then you would leave. They did not do that. Um, they were, they left, they brought, they took the military out, they left civilians, they left our supporters behind, and they abandoned the airport, meaning that people who were still there really had no real way to escape. Now, the U.S. Marine who published this video where he was basically saying any other military officer, any other troop within the U.S. military, if they were to make a stupid move, they got people killed like this did, they'd be punished for it. There'd be a process and they would be held accountable. And so he was asking, well, shouldn't the higher ups be held accountable as well? Is there a limit to which people should be held accountable depending, you know, dependent on rank? Well, normally you would think that the standards that apply to troops, whether they're uh, lower level officers or high lo higher level officers should be the same. Now, do you think he was taken seriously? I'm afraid not, folks. He has been now thrown in jail for posting that video, according to a report. It says here, the U.S. Marine dismissed for command uh, from command after criticizing senior military leadership on the handling of the U.S. troop withdrawal from Afghanistan is in the brig, according to reports. Now, this is one family member saying this. He said, all our son did is ask the question that everybody was asking themselves but they were too scared to speak out loud, as according to Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller's father, Stu Scheller, Sr. He told this to Task and Purpose, which is a military publication. Continues stating, he was asking for accountability. In fact, I think he even asked for an apology that we made mistakes, but they couldn't do that, which is mind blowing. Scheller first published a video on his personal Facebook account on August 26, criticizing the Afghanistan withdrawal which drew backlash. Defending that video, he published a further clip saying he was calling for accountability of my senior leaders, his words, over, quote, obvious mistakes that were made. And he said as well, I'm not saying we can take back what was what has been done. All I asked for was all I asked for was accountability for people to comment on what I said and to say, yes, mistakes were made and that they and, and had they done that, I would have gone back into rank and file, submitted, and accomplished what I wanted, Scheller said at the time, announcing that he was also resigning his commission. He's in jail now, folks, for saying that. Now, at the same time, top U.S. military leaders were testifying before Congress about the U.S. troop withdrawal from Afghanistan, and something interesting is happening now, which is these top U.S. military officials are saying that they themselves actually warned that they they did not want the pullout to happen. A decision was made basically somewhere in the in-between between their communications and President Joe Biden to pull out like we did. Someone made a very bad decision. Will someone be held accountable as this U.S. Marine who is now thrown in jail for making this statement? Is someone going to be held accountable? Who knows, folks? Uh, but essentially, that's where the U.S. is at while China is preparing for war. Now, that said, folks, um, so the halfway point, so I, I went a bit over the usual halfway point. But if you have questions, leave them in the chat now. I try to get to them after questions. I want to go into what's happening in New York State with this uh, state of emergency now been declared because they're having a shortage of healthcare workers. Does anyone remember several weeks ago where I suggested this was probably going to happen based on the trajectory of where things were going? Because guess what, folks? The writing was on the wall in Europe where you had these exact same policies requiring healthcare workers to get vaccinated. A lot of healthcare workers refused to get vaccinated, and they have hospitals that can't maintain staffing because of it. Now, we were talking about this happening because... We saw it happen in other countries, the exact same pattern taking place. And typically with any kind of pattern taking place, you look at the trajectory of that pattern. Obviously, that same policy based on people not wanting to get vaccinated and numbers and all these other things would show you that very likely the same thing would happen in the U.S. And folks, it's now happening in the U.S., New York State has now declared a state of emergency because they don't have enough doctors to fill hospital roles. And they're talking about bringing the National Guard in. I'm going to be explaining that a few other stories. First, let's go into questions. So again, if you have questions, leave them in the chat. 
Um, also, folks, I mentioned before that we're still demonetized by YouTube, but luckily we've started our own platform. That's Epic TV, E P O C H TV dot com forward slash crossroads. Uh, we have some great content there. Uh, crossroads, the channel you're watching now, has a lot of exclusive videos there. We just did a great video talking about the possibilities of what a tax free America could look like. Something that may sound far out, folks, but if you go back to the time of the founding fathers, that was actually the case. Uh, income tax is a new thing, basically. Now, can we ever go back to that? Great discussion on that. I'll show you a quick trailer now of that discussion. And again, that's on Epic TV. How about we get people who are wealthy and big companies to pay more without taxes and give better service for the working poor middle class? One of the big questions in this country right now is the idea of, uh, I'd say, taxes and what are some of the alternatives? We have lots of bridges and tunnels in New York City. So I said, why don't we lease the naming rights to all of our bridges in New York City? I'm talking about a bridge that gets mentioned hundreds of times on the radio stations and TV when it comes to traffic reports in a 16 million metro person area. This idea of lessening the size of the government yep. in order to strengthen community and also people having the ability to take care of themselves more. That Our goal has to always be to create more community opportunities, to create an environment where you have extra competition with government. So the goal always is to break the monopoly of government. All right, folks, again, that's the interview with Larry Sharp. He was, I believe, the vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party, I believe, in 2016. A great interview with him. Check it out. That's on Epoch TV exclusively. You can find the link to that in the description below this video and in the chat. Uh, folks, please check it out. It's great. Um, all right, let's go into some questions now, and then I'll go into some more stories. First question up is from Crazy Morp. He said, question, Josh. If we have so much money to give to other countries and our enemies, we're going to be giving money to the Taliban already, folks. Why are we $20, $29 trillion in debt? Yes. He said, just stop giving everyone billions in gender studies and pay back us Americans. Well, you're not being, you're not making jokes here. Yes, folks. We uh, Part of the COVID bailout package gave money to like Pakistan for gender studies programs. A lot of that money that was supposed to go to Americans actually went to a lot of countries for things that had nothing of any value for most Americans. It's literally giving money to people in other countries for things that have no systems of accountability, no way of tracing where they're going or what it's being used for. Now you're saying, am I right or am I right? And I'd have to agree with you. If America's having trouble financially, then why give billions of dollars to countries that don't even like us very much? That was one of the big questions Trump raised when he was still president, actually. Now, the other big thing is as well is if the government's about to default, essentially, because of the, we're hitting the debt ceiling, it's going to raise some questions on where the money's been spent. Now, folks, if you want to see a great model for small government in a functioning town, check out Idlewild, California. I'm only half joking here. Did you know that the governor, or sorry, the mayor of Idlewild is actually a golden retriever, a golden retriever in a cowboy hat. His name is Mayor Max. I'm serious. If you want to have a good laugh, look it up. Uh, a, a good reminder, though, that small government can work. And folks, I would probably take a golden retriever wearing the cowboy hat over some of the officials we have in power right now, um, especially here in New York. But... Who am I to say? That's my opinion. Um, yeah, folks, it, it is an issue, though, just generally that we are overspending. We are over budget. And typically, if you're over budget, you don't overspend. You know, it, imagine that you're managing your own personal finances. You see that you're spending, you know, 10 percent over your budget every month. Now, what do you do? Do you keep spending 10% over your budget every month and buy, you know, get register for a new credit card and keep maxing out credit cards, which is essentially what our government's been doing uh, when it comes to taking out more and more money and getting us more and more to debt and issuing more and more bonds and so on? Or do you look at where you're spending and start cutting the things that you can't afford and that are not necessary? Uh, typically, you're going to look and cut the things that are not necessary. Now, a lot of people on, on more on the left have been talking about cutting the military, cutting defense budgets. But frankly, 
this is at a time when the Chinese Communist Party is literally telling its military to prepare for war may not be a good idea. Uh, luckily, they don't seem like they're going to be doing that. At the same time, though, yes, we're giving billions upon billions upon billions of dollars to many, many, many countries around the world. And frankly, you know, you're not going to be giving money to your neighbor probably every month if you're if you don't have enough money to make ends meet every month. This would be normal fiscal responsibility. Um, so I do have to agree with you here, although that's my opinion. Uh, another question here from Spy Cho. He said, is there maybe a relationship between the rise in crime, the tens of thousands of police quitting, and Josh's comment about the Fed trying to force out the police forces in so they can legitimize a federal police force? My analysis, folks. Um, this is typically the way. Now, I'm not saying that the government's doing this intentionally. I'm not saying this is intentional, but this is the trajectory you're following. Great book I recommend reading. It's almost impossible to find a print copy of it. It's a book by a man named Thomas Schulman, S-C-H-U-L-M-A-N. You can find archive copies of it on the internet. It's very short, I think like 30-ish pages. Great book. It's called Love Letter to America. Uh, Thomas Schulman is the pseudonym given to uh, Yuri Bezmenov. Uh, very well known. He had a lot of YouTube videos that went viral recorded, I don't even know how long ago. Basically, he died. Um, a lot of people think the Soviet Union might have killed him because he was a propaganda officer under the Soviet Union who defected to the West, to Canada. Uh, he died. It's not clear whether it was natural causes or someone killed him. But um, you can either watch his video series, Yuri Bezmenov, fantastic videos. I really can't recommend them enough. Or read his book under the pseudonym Thomas Schulman called Love Letter to America. He describes how the Soviet Union's main fighting force was what are what is what is called di uh, sorry um what is called ideological subversion. Ideological subversion is basically how you bring a country a closed country to an open or sorry an open country to a closed country. And it works on four different stages, uh, demoralization, destabilization, conflict, and normalization. And let me explain this. Basically, the demoralization stage is where you start infiltrating the institutions of a country and you start using them to make them serve the opposite function of what they're meant to. You make the unions become things that you know, work towards the communist goal. You make the student unions work towards the communist goal. You get entertainment and you pervert it. You make it dirty. You destroy people's faith and religions. You get into the churches and you do terrible things, commit crimes and make people not want to go to churches anymore. You take church and religion and you make it into entertainment. He describes these processes. Historically, books, for example, like Disinformation by Ion Mihai Pacepa, another Soviet defector, talks about how, how under Ceausescu and the Romanian regime, they were doing things like this. They took over, for example, the World Council of Churches in order to subvert the churches. They were doing this. Um, documentary, you can watch on that. Uh, Enemies Within the Church, I believe it was co-produced by, um, oh, geez, I can't remember the name of the individual now. Anyways, I won't go too deep into that. So in other words, the first stage, demoralization. You destroy people's faith. You destroy their faith in government. You make the system no longer functional. You upend the entire system, all the elements of social harmony. If America is a country of multi, multiple cultures and multiple races, working together under, under the common idea of liberty, you turn them against each other. You make races hate each other. You make them fight each other. You turn people against each other culturally. You destroy the American idea that unites us, right? That's ideological subversion, the demoralization stage. You bring it from demoralization then into destabilization, where not only are things serving the opposite roles, but they actually stop functioning in some regards. You make the police no longer police. You make the uh, different systems that keep the country running no longer serving their functions. Once you destabilize the country, once you destabilize it, the process of that and going into conflict is a very thin time frame. You want people fighting on the streets. You want mass protests. You want riots. You want 
uh, people fighting each other openly. That is conflict. When you bring it, to the, you want crime, you want murder rates skyrocketing like they are right now, for example. You want to defund the police movements, for example. You want police quitting their jobs. You want law enforcement standing by where people, while people shoot up heroin in Times Square as they are now doing. That is crisis. Now, the after crisis comes normalization. And normalization is essentially where people become so distraught that the discomfort of the chaos they are witnessing becomes so deep that they will accept any cure you offer them. There's a Chinese saying, a sick man will seek any doctor, right? And folks, that doctor in some cases is the stabilizing force of big government, a.k.a. socialism. And so the Soviet Union was doing this to the United States. The Chinese Communist Party took that flag and continues to bear it under operations like the United Front Work Department and others. And you also have organizations right here in America doing the same thing. Organizations like the Fabian Society, um, organizations previously like the um, Frankfurt School, cultural Marxism, critical theory, which led to critical race theory the black, national, black nationalism movement in the early 1900s, things like this. All of them have been working essentially from different angles on the same basic goals. And folks, it is culminating. Now, given the issue of what happens if police no longer police and they can't do their jobs and they're quitting and they all quit, will the government then accept essentially anarchy or will they try to reinstitute order under newly established powers that let them control things that they couldn't control under the police? Probably the latter. Because socialism always works through force. Socialism always works through force and it cannot function without force. Because socialism without an enforcement mechanism is just philanthropy, right? It's about sharing, folks. No, it's about pointing a gun at someone's head and taking from them half of what they own or more. That's socialism. It does not work without force. They need to have an enforcement arm. But because of the way America's set up, where sheriffs, of course, are elected officials who can choose not even to enforce laws, you can't do it. You can't enforce it in the United States unless you overturn the systems that make America what it is. And one way you could do that is, well, put so much pressure on them, they quit their jobs, and folks, you can establish a new force under government control, direct. Not saying this is their intention, but intentional or not, it does seem to be that that, that is the trajectory. So I'll go over just a couple more questions then a few more stories. Hmm. Drink tonight, by the way is ginseng tea with a bit of honey. One of my personal favorites. Also a seasonal herbal concoction I made with um, honeysuckle and chrysanthemum. It's very nice. All right, folks. Let's go over just one more question, then some more stories. This is from Solar Power 4. You said, hi, Josh. Can you talk about the nefarious behavior in some of the documents about Comey, etc., where where font changes, he said, and are being blamed on misspelling of his name to Corny so that FOIA requests will not pull up these critical documents. Um, okay, so basically you still have the whole crossfire hurricane investigation happening where, yes, James Comey and other individuals within our intelligence community, law enforcement community, community FBI, and so on, seem to, in many ways, have colluded to spy on the Trump campaign using documents given to them by uh, individuals tied to Fusion GPS, taken from Russian sources that were never verified, collected by a former British spy, Christopher Steele, financed by the DNC and the Clinton campaign. You, uh, you have John Durham, of course, looking into this. We don't really hear much happening with this in order to fully investigate and expose it. But the interesting thing with the Durham report, or the Durham, not report, we haven't seen it yet, but the Durham case that just came out, and Durham is the special counsel put in place under Barr to investigate this. We never saw his full report, but he did recently press charges. One of the big things that Durham did with this, um, with his recently recent charges, is he actually laid out what could be a case of conspiracy. 
that could incriminate any individual named within that conspiracy. In other words, you no longer have a picture of just one individual possibly doing something wrong. You have multiple individuals across agencies, across um, even parties, and across media organizations, and across um, individuals possibly doing it for whatever interest they may have. The big issue you're going to have essentially is because basically a conspiracy case has been laid out in that report. The big question is, did they do it knowingly? That knowingly part is the difficult part to prove. Do they do it intentionally? Uh, frankly, things like FOIA requests and uh, getting their communications could demonstrate that. And we'll have to see if that is the case. But the case has been laid out under Durham's report. Uh, I'll go over one more question, then we'll go into some more stories. This is from Cameron Bacon. He said, Josh, did you see that America First Legal filed a FOIA request regarding the Biden regime facilitating human child trafficking? So many of these politicians and bureaucrats seem to always have ties to human trafficking and the CCP. I have not seen that report, but I will look into it. Uh, frankly, even regardless of anything, what is now happening at the U.S.-Mexico border does constitute child trafficking in many regards. That was one of the reasons, and I'll, I'll explain this, hear me out. That was one of the reasons why the Trump administration made it so they had to give DNA tests on individuals caught with children at the border because a lot of those people were not actually their relatives or parents. They were. They, this is how the cartels work, the coyotes, which are the human traffickers, right? Mexican coyotes, the coyotes are the Mexican ones, the snakeheads are the Chinese human traffickers, right? That's what you call them. The way the coyotes are doing this, and it's a multi-billion dollar business, of course, um, between the cartels and so on, is because of the way the US immigration system works. If you have a kid with you, it's much, much easier. And so they get these kids and they traffic them and they use them essentially like slaves where individuals take these kids and they bring them across. You can buy kids or rent a kid or whatever. You bring them across and then they keep using those kids essentially. Now, the way that the Trump administration tried stopping that from happening was through DNA tests and also by separating kids being trafficked from their traffickers. And remember that was... The media ran with that narrative. Remember the whole kids in cages narrative? Well, first of all, the cage pictures that first came out were not actually from anything real. It was from a protest. Um, the, the pictures that they used after the kids in cages pictures were actually from the Obama era. They weren't even Trump administration era. And then, of course, by that time, people had been so emotionally agitated that it didn't matter what information you fed them. They had already got this image of kids in cages in their minds, and it wasn't changing. But the entire purpose, purpose of that policy was to stop child trafficking because the coyotes, the human traffickers, were using children to traffic to, for the purpose of illegal immigration. Those kids were being trafficked. And so that is where things are at. Now, government officials who changed that policy, despite information that would have informed that decision, are they then guilty of human trafficking or aiding in human trafficking? Possibly. Uh, possibly so, especially if the court can demonstrate that the policy does allow for that to happen. Now, can they actually sue the government for doing that? Maybe not, but they can get FOIA requests, as you're suggesting America Legal First has done. And those FOIA requests could demonstrate some of the internal discussions based, based on what I just discussed, uh, which very likely they do have. And again, if they're doing it knowingly, that's a pretty big deal. All right, folks, um, I want to mention, too, before I forget, be sure to tune in. To, I want to go into some stories out of this, but be sure to tune in tomorrow. We're going to have a special live Q&A. Uh, that special live Q&A is going to be focused on the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda campaign right now. That's going to be tomorrow, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm going to be moderating it. We have Natalie Winters from National Pulse. We have Chris Fenton. We have Antonio uh, Grisaf, uh, talking about this and folks, it's going to be a really, really, sorry, Grisefo. I'm sorry, Antonio Grisefo. We're going to be talking about this tomorrow night, folks. Be sure to tune in. That's going to be 7 30 PM Eastern time. And so, yeah, be sure to tune in special live Q and a, in addition to our normal schedule, we're still going to have one on Thursday. Don't worry. This is in addition to the normal schedule. 
All right, folks, that said, uh, let me go into a couple more stories because it is getting late and I want to cover a bit of what else is happening. Now, first off, if you've been watching this show for a while, you probably knew this was going to happen, which is the New York governor has declared a state of emergency because thousands of healthcare workers are refusing to get vaccinated, meaning they're going to get laid off without pay, a.k.a. basically fired. It says here, New York Governor uh, Kathy Hochul, because again, uh, again, Cuomo was removed from office or it stepped down, on Monday night declared a state of emergency to deal with possible staffing shortfalls resulting from the nationwide vaccination mandate for healthcare workers. Last night, the Democrat governor wrote on Twitter yesterday, I took bold action and signed an executive order that will alleviate potential staffing shortages in our hospitals and other healthcare facilities across New York State. And she said, my desire is to have the people who've been out there continue to work in their jobs, working in them safely. She said this Monday to news conference in the Bronx. And she said to all the other healthcare workers who are vaccinated, they also deserve to know that the people they're working with will not get them sick. Uh, because, folks, God forbid people who are immune to, the va- immune to the virus because they've been vaccinated get sick by people who are not vaccinated because somehow it doesn't make them immune. <laughs> but anyways, it says here, it's not clear why Hochul suggests that someone who is vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus would be at a higher risk of getting sick from someone who isn't vaccinated. Some studies have shown that fully vaccinated individuals, in, in addition to this, can transmit the virus. This is actually a really important point to note because, frankly, folks, this is one of the biggest holes in the vaccine mandate narrative. If they're worried, if, if the concern of having unva- people who make a health care choice, you've decided that you don't want to get the vaccine, you want to take your, take your chances with the virus. If you've made that decision, right, it is your body, your choice. You've made the decision you don't want to get injected with an mRNA vaccine, gene therapy. I don't think you can call it vaccines, although they change the definition of it. You decide you don't want to get it. You've made this choice, but they're saying that doing so is selfish because you may infect others. That's the narrative. But according to the CDC itself, which is why they reinstituted the mask policies, People who've already gotten the vaccine can also transmit the virus. That is why the CDC, after they told people you don't have to wear the the mask anymore if you're vaccinated, that's why they rolled back that policy. Because people who are vaccinated can still transmit the virus. And so vaccinated people can transmit the virus just like unvaccinated people can. Then why is it that they're saying people who are not vaccinated are somehow a threat to people who are vaccinated. Doesn't that contradict the entire statement? It's another note, of course, a side note. Now, of course, federal officials have asserted that the vaccine protects against serious illness and hospitalization. Data from Israel demonstrates otherwise, but that's what they say. Over the weekend, Hochul said that she would direct the National Guard, and this is where New York City's at, New York State is at, direct the National Guard to potentially replace healthcare workers who were terminated or suspended from their jobs due to their vaccination status. And again, you have thousands of them not doing so. Her office also raised the possibility of hiring accredited nurses from other states and other countries who are those who are retired. And so folks, you have the same crisis taking place across the United States, the same types of shortages taking place across the United States because the federal government has made it so that healthcare workers have to get the virus or get the vaccine. Now they're also having this for the military, which could blow a hole in the idea of getting the national guard vaccinated, but they're talking about bringing in non U S citizens, people from other countries to fill the holes in the U S medical system because Americans, thousands of them don't want in New York city alone, New York state alone, sorry, don't want to get the vaccine. That's where things are at. Now, it's getting late, but I want to go over one more story, so bear with me. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because this is important. Now, folks, you may be wondering when this is going to be over, when the mandates and lockdowns and vaccine mandates and vaccine passports are going to be over. Biden has now shown us 
the light at the end of the tunnel. And he's saying that we can go back to normal once vaccine, vaccination rates among Americans reach 96 to 98 percent. Now, it's not clear whether he's talking about the hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants who they're not testing or forcing to vaccinate entering the country right now, who they're redistributing across different states. It's not clear whether that includes non-citizens who they're bringing in by the hundreds of thousands, not testing for the virus and not getting vaccinated. But if you're a U.S. citizen, uh, folks, we got to get 96 to 98 percent if you want to have your rights and freedoms back, according to Biden. It says briefly here, President Joe Biden told reporters at the White House on Monday that 96 to 98 percent of Americans need to be vaccinated before the nation can go back to normal. He said this, I think we get the most, the vast majority, like is going on in some industries and in some schools, 96, 97, 98 percent. I think we're getting awful close. So he's also not saying for a fact that when it's 96, 97, 98 percent vaccinated, that he's going to reopen things and drop these. He's saying he thinks so. So he's not directly saying it. And he said as well, but I'm not the scientist. So maybe, maybe, maybe not, folks. We'll have to see on that. The president said this in response to a question about how many people need to be vaccinated for the United States to go back to normal. And Joe Biden said this as well. He said, but one thing for certain, a quarter of the country can't go unvaccinated and thus not continue to have a problem. So that's where things are at with that. Uh, he's also encouraging more businesses to enforce vaccine mandates. And folks, that is that. All right. Well, that said, folks, a uh, lot going on in the country, as we can plainly see. I'll be giving updates, of course, just like this every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So be sure to tune in for our live Q&As, 1030 p.m. Eastern Time. Also, as I mentioned, tomorrow night, we're going to have a special episode, a special live Q&A. Uh, talking about, again, with individuals like Natalie Winters of National Pulse and others about the CCP's propaganda campaign they're launching right now using foreign assets. It's going to be a great discussion. Also, how people in the U.S. intelligence in the community, people, well, sorry, U.S. government, um, people within the universities and so on are being co-opted by the Chinese Communist Party as part of their programs to subvert this country. It's going to be a great discussion. Be sure to tune in tomorrow night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time for this special episode. Um, folks, also, again, I've mentioned we have Epic TV now. If you want to support Crossroads, a great way to do so is go to Epic TV. You can click the link in the description below or in the chat. Fantastic, folks. Be sure to check it out. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um we actually had a great episode just recently on American thought leaders with the co-founder of Wikipedia, uh, who gave some very interesting statements talking about why Wikipedia has failed to do what they intended to originally do. Uh, it's a good, it's a great discussion. Be sure to check it out. I have the link to that also in the description below. And folks, that's Epic TV, e p o c h t v dot com forward slash crossroads. Now, folks, that said, I'll see you tomorrow night. And as always, please take care of yourselves, stay informed, and stay free. Thank you.